Hi, Greg. How are you doing? I am well, thank you. Great. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, uh, the there's been a lot made um, about the, the long journey to this point in sort of realizing the uh, Fletch reboot and getting it off the ground. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you became involved with the reboot? Um, John Hamm approached me and said, would you ever be interested in directing a Fletch movie? I knew of the novels, but I hadn't read them. And I, I do love detective and crime fiction. And for some reason, I just haven't gotten to them, but I heard they were great. Um, so... I went off and, and read a bunch of them and loved them. And John had already decided he thought uh, Confess Fletch should be the one to be adapted. And a writer was already involved. His name is Zev Barrow. And um, uh, John and I talked about the tone of the film and how we want to go closer to the tone of the novels and, and that John wasn't going to try to do a Chevy Chase impersonation as much as we both love the original Fletch. Uh, we thought, you know, this isn't, this shouldn't be a nostalgia exercise and we shouldn't try to rip off Chevy's take on it because he obviously brought a tremendous amount because uh, he's a great comic. Um, so when the script came in, uh, it was a very funny script, but it felt like a script for Chevy Chase. Uh, Zev, who's a great writer and a great guy, really loves the original Fletch and couldn't stop himself from kind of writing Fletch 3. Uh, and John and I said, well, this is, this is great, but it's not really the tone we wanted. So, um, I, I did the next pass on the script and, and brought it closer to the book and brought in more characters from the book and more plot from the book. And, um, you know, still setting it in contemporary times. So, uh, a lot of things had to be kind of a modern equivalent of what was a seventies vibe character or a bit of social satire from the novel. And, uh, you know, to me, it was a dream come true to to do a detective movie because that's really what all the novels are it's just gregory mcdonald cast a, an investigative journalist in the detective role um and i love those movies i'm a huge fan of the maltese falcon and the long goodbye and the big sleep um the genre in general uh so yeah i i was very excited to do it as far as the fletch curse is concerned the way the way we basically got around it was we were told that the movie had to be done at a certain number um, and we'd have to work fast, wouldn't have a big budget. And uh, because because people <laughs> weren't sure, you know, it's fallen apart so many times attempt to bring Fletch back. I think I think there's, you know, there's a question of whether or not that was viable. Um, so we worked under those restrictions and they supported us and it was I'm, I'm really happy with the film we made um so you said that you weren't as familiar with the Fletch novels um how, how familiar were you with the you know the the original Chevy Chase films were they part of your formative movie going experience or oh absolutely I was I uh, my parents somehow let me stay up and watch Saturday Night Live from the first season um, I must have been about, I don't know, eight years old, nine years old. And uh, I was a huge fan of Chevy uh, all through my growing up. And so, yeah, I love the first Fletch and there's much that really cracks me up in the second Fletch. Um, but I particularly love the first one, as, as many people do. Um, and it was hard not, you know, to want to do it more like that movie at times because... It was so ingrained in my head, but I, I, yeah, we decided we got to try and do it our own way. Um, even though there's obviously overlapping DNA because the character is the character, but a lot of the stuff Chevy brought to it aren't in the books, like uh, phony names and and disguises and things like that are more Chevy's style of of slapstick that he's a, a genius at. But in, interestingly, the you know the the phony names and stuff that's something that you did decide to to keep with this version. We did, we did, but we didn't go for uh, too many of the of the sort of fa you know famous fictional characters or celebrity names like you know when Chevy says he's Ted Nugent or Don Corleone or whoever. Yeah. So uh, yeah, well that actually does exist in the books. He uses he uses fake names at times to manipulate people and pretend to be someone he's not. Yeah, and um, you know, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who were skeptical upon hearing about a you know a Fletch reboot because you know a lot of in a lot of people's minds Fletch is Chevy Chase, you know, 
But, um, you know, I think that John Hamm not only really nails the sort of, you know, cheeky nonchalance of the character, but he does update it and, and, and bring something new to it. Um, what was it like developing this updated version of the character with him? Well, one of the things we talked about a lot is he he shouldn't punch down. He should only punch up if he's really going to be a bit, um, you know, if it's going to veer into a little bit of of, of mockery or sending someone up uh, in, in a slightly crueler way, it should only be people who kind of deserve it, like the, the wealthy um, influencer or people at the yacht club, people who are, you know, privileged and and tone deaf and and could use a kick in the shins. Um, he's a, willing to kind of lie to anybody, but it's it's a, uh, you know, it's it's yeah. Just we just wanted didn't want it to feel like he was condescending to to people um, who are beneath him on the economic ladder or something like that. Um, and um, and the other thing, you know. Working with John, John's played, you know, obviously Don Draper looms large in John's career, and Don Draper was a, a tortured character with secrets. Fletch is not. Fletch is, is is not any of those things. Fletch enjoys life, enjoys people, finds it all amusing. Certain things do appall him. I mean, I think our Fletch is more vulnerable and and uh, a, a little more bothered by things than uh, Chevy's version. Uh, and that was, you know, kind of, taken from the novel. Uh, in the novel also, Fletch is wrong uh, at times, and we decided it would be better, you know, you don't want to watch John Hamm be right 100% of the time. Uh, it's, it's obnoxious. <laughs> you know, it's it's bad enough that we have to deal with his his ge superior genetics than have him also be smarter than all of us. <laughs> um, it just doesn't seem fair, although John is very smart. Um, and so, so you know, we, we took those things from the book and we, um, and, you know, it's interesting when it is a character that's only been played by one actor very famously, because uh, the, the example I would always use, use with John is that Philip Marlowe, who's um, uh, Raymond Chandler's detective character, was played by Humphrey Bogart in The Big Sleep, and he was played by a bunch of other actors over time. Um, one of my favorite versions is L.A. Gould playing him in, in, in Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye. And those, those performances, those interpretations of the character could not be more different. But those movies were only 27 years apart um, because we used to, <laughs> culture changed uh, more rapidly back then. As for as fast as everything goes right now, it's it's interesting that like uh, the original Fletch was 37 years ago, um, but because no one else has played the character, not even on television, whereas Marlowe was played by James Garner on TV and, and um, Robert Mitchum in old age. And so <clears throat> it was acceptable to, to have different versions of that character and we thought well you know Fletch is fair game he's a fictional character other people can adapt him at other times and and we're we certainly don't feel like we have uh ownership of this character um so yeah we thought about all that stuff and and you know John is uh, I love the idea of putting John at the center of a comedy he's more reactive than Chevy's version there's there's a lot of the humor comes from the other characters whereas everyone else is kind of a straight man in the Chevy version to Chevy um and you know, I, I I love the idea of putting John in the middle of that and having a sustained comic performance that I think I hope would surprise people. Um, you're also a filmmaker who has made, in my mind, some you know quintessentially modern uh, comedies. You know, I think particularly of Superbad as as kind of a modern classic in in the um, in the comedy genre. Was it fun, kind of not reverting, but but you know, exploring something that was a little bit more old fashioned with a little bit more of a screwball, classic screwball sensibility. Um, yeah, I mean, I I can't help but bring my influences to stuff. I mean, even Superbad was greatly influenced by the the comedies I grew up with, like Animal House and Meatballs and, you know, a lot of stuff that was, you know, R-rated comedies that we were sneaking into as as teenagers. Um, in this case, yes, I, I I love old movies and 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 I like the idea of trying to do something that was leaned a little more witty and a little less on on sex jokes and um, 
and you know pop culture references and things that a lot of comedy is and i'm i've done a lot of that too um i just wanted it to to, to be a little more old-fashioned in that sense um and i think you know it's interesting um i mean some people really appreciate that and some people just feel like well where are the sex jokes <laughs> and you know where's all the where's all the fun stuff um but uh yeah that's very much what i I, I, yeah, I just, that's how I wanted to go about it. I, I, I like those kinds of movies and I feel like there's not that many of them uh, quite in that style these days. Although of course, you know, what are movies right now anyway? It's, it's all such a weird transitional time. I hope they don't go away. Yeah, and, and just finally, what's the likelihood that we'll get to see more of uh, John Hamm's flip? Well, I am starting to write a sequel uh, whether it will get made, um, we'll see. I mean, we had such a sh strange release, which is fully a product of the times we live in that because this movie skews a little older, I think um, there wasn't a clear idea where the money can be made on a film like this. Um, so we had this hybrid kind of a uh, little bit of theatrical, a little bit of, of PVOD, you know, video on demand. And, and now in America, we're on Showtime and there'll be some kind of similar thing in the UK. Uh, I'm pleased that it's finding its audience and that people seem to really, you know, um, like it, uh, some people. And there's, you know, it's it, 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 it did what I hoped it would do, which would feel like an alternate to what, what we're getting a lot of. Um, whether or not someone thinks there's, it's worth spending the money to do another one is, is something I just can only hope for. And, uh, you know, I'll write it and I'll try to do the best job I can. And hopefully they'll say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let you do one more. Yeah. Well, I, for one, hope that the, the, the money is made available for that. Cause I'd love to see more. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. It's been really good. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Sorry for yapping so long. <laughs> no problem though. No. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. Okay.